special gathering of a group of friends now for a little over a year of just seeking the Lord together in prayer. And this special group of friends for me is a group of pastors that are pastoring a variety of churches, standing on similar platforms, presenting the same truth of God. And we have just been meeting together, seeking God's face with one another. That was one of the desires on my heart when we came here. When we moved here in August of 20, I wanted to connect with like-minded pastors. One, that I could have some friends Uh, not that I'm not friends with y'all, but friends with guys who just, they know the role, they know the mantle, they, they get it. And that we could seek God's face together and to consider what he might do in us and through us in partnership. And I look back at, at what God has already orchestrated with partnerships and outreach and, and different opportunities, and now this night of worship that's coming, and it, it, it all just began by a group of people seeking to care for each other. We're not problem-solving each other's churches. We're not talking about our elders. We're not doing anything like that. We're just simply seeking God together and checking in on one another, and it is, it's life-giving. It's what I hope uh, also happens in our life group settings within the church. And really, when we looked back at at this uh, book of Titus that we're going through, a couple of weeks ago, we, we started part one of how you know a church is healthy, and we really looked at how the church treats one another when we're here, when we're gathered together, what those relationships are supposed to be like. Evan reminded us in a very powerful and very clear way that Everything is centered around the work and the grace of Jesus Christ. So we're dependent on the work and the grace of Christ just to treat each other well. With respect and kindness and deference and humility. Seeking self-control and and the Christian life together. Generations speaking into other generations. That's what it's supposed to be like when we're in the church. And it is all centered around the gracious work of Jesus. Jesus. Well, as we close this book of Titus, we're really looking at how we know a church is healthy, and that is demonstrated. There's a sign of health on how we live outside the church. And that's how Titus has constructed this book. There's kind of this narrative flow. We have instructions to leaders, instructions for the household of God, and then instructions for what the church should do and be in the world. And so that's where we're landing the plane in this little letter that Paul wrote to a young pastor. Why don't you join me in Titus chapter 3? We're going to work through the uh, the entire chapter in one message. I know you can gasp, but we're going to cover 15 verses in in one setting here. The book of Titus, starting in chapter 3, verse 1. I'm going to read through the text, and then we're going to talk through it together. Titus 3, 1 says, Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, Led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and, kind and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things, so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. But avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. As for a person who stirs up division, after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful 
he is self-condemned. When I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. Do your best to speed Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their way. See that they lack nothing. And let our people learn to devote themselves to good works so as to help cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful. All who are with me send greetings to you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. All right. So as we look at this text, we're going we're gonna to go in three sections, and I want to just give you the passage outline at the top. We're going to be looking, first of all, at our, so when the word our is used, it's our, the church, our conduct towards outsiders, how we're supposed to behave toward those who live in the world around us, our conduct toward outsiders. That's going to cover the first two verses. Then we have our salvation story. A couple of times in the book of Titus, Paul has given specific focus to the unique work of Jesus and the gospel message. Evan preached through it in chapter 2, and now we have it again here in chapter 3. It's precious doctrinal truth that is the center of what it means to be Christian. So we'll look at our salvation story. And then finally, our love toward outsiders. So it begins with our conduct toward outsiders, what we can control. We're reminded of our salvation story and then our outward love toward outsiders. So conduct, salvation, and love. Those are kind of our pillars as we go through the text today. So let's look at chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. And this is the text. It says, remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities. So this is Paul instructing Titus to tell the church what they are to be in their community. Remind them, the church, the household of God, to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. Now, what should stand out to us in the context of this letter is that every quality or aspect that that Paul is calling the church to be is everything the Cretan culture isn't. Do you remember in chapter 1 when Paul was describing what Crete was like? This is the context in which uh, the people were, uh, where Titus was to raise up leaders. There's many who are insubordinate, empty talkers, deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silenced. They're upsetting families. It says, a Cretan, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. And this testimony is true. So here, Paul in chapter 3 is calling the church to live in a different way, even though... The leadership and the culture around them is not treating them in the same way. There's not perfect courtesy being displayed toward the church. There's not gentleness. There's not uh, this idea that you're not to speak evil of others. There's this opposite culture in which they live. And yet the call for the church is to be submissive and respectful. This is carried over in, in a variety of other uh, sections of the Bible. Paul wrote in Romans 13, verses 1 through 4, listen to this theme. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of the conscience. For, bearing, for because of this, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. In Romans, we get this outline of what does submission look like in in our culture. Well, it's in taxes and revenue 
and respect and honor. Peter wrote about this. 1 Peter 2, 13 to 17, Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors or the Tomball Police Department. Oh, that's not in there. Or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Peter emphasizes that we we are free in Christ. But... We should not abuse our freedom and not use it as a cover for for doing or saying evil things. Now, there's a limit, isn't there, when it comes to the Christian in a broken and fallen world, there is a limit to where we can draw the line of when the church rises up against authorities and when we submit, and the guidance for when that time has come to rise up against authorities. Authority is found in Acts chapter 5. Luke wrote, And when they had brought them, Peter and John, before them, before the council, and the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charged you not to teach in this name, the name of Jesus. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Now, I recognize that I have covered quite a bit of scripture. The the line for the church of when we are to submit or not submit to the governing authorities is if we are told we cannot proclaim the name of Jesus Christ. That is the line. As citizens of the kingdom of God, we are free in Christ to proclaim his name. And that's why we have brothers and sisters in parts of the world where it is, it is unlawful to proselytize or evangelize. It is unlawful to spread the name of Jesus. Do so anyway. They carry in Bibles because they carry in the name of Jesus, who is King of kings and Lord of lords. But in all other matters, there should be an attitude of submission to our authorities. And this has been a challenge. This really has been a challenge and really uh, has, has challenged churches, especially in the United States and the Western world, in a way that we've never been challenged. When a global pandemic struck and there was government regulation about, about how people should gather and what limits there should be, Y'all remember that? Does anyone remember that? And no church, no pastor anywhere had the best answer. No one knew exactly what to do. And there were a variety of opinions that formed quite quickly. I've talked about that before. And so elders and pastors had to go under this principle of we must do what seems right to respect authority and to submit willingly. It just was complicated because to whom do you submit? To what level of authority do you go? Y'all, we live in Harris County. And that was tough because there was leadership within Harris County that, that gave regulations that contradicted who? The governor of our state. So there's another level of authority. And then you have national leadership and policies and regulations and who are you? And so it took churches to gather as elders and pastors and leaders to, to do what seemed right. And it was a situation where uh, we certainly couldn't please everyone or every conviction. 
But the heart behind how TBC elders and other churches have, have sought to do this was to, was to submit and respect. But there was a toll that, that came with not gathering together and people really struggled. Isolation was hard. Depression set in. Loneliness, disconnectedness affected people. The, the pattern or the habit of gathering together was disrupted. There was a cost and a price to that. And there are some who haven't yet come to reconnect. This message is really not about what has happened in the last two years, but it is this idea that the attitude of churches and elders and pastors should be to respect our authorities. This gets down into the nitty-gritty of the different megaphones we have in which we can speak. Let me look again at Titus 3, 1 to 2. He says, remind them, remind them. That means that it's hard to sustain this kind of view in a broken world. In a culture like Crete that is set against the things of God, the church is having to be reminded, reminded, this is the mindset which we must hold. To be submissive, obedient, ready for every good work, speaking evil of no one, avoiding quarreling, to be gentle and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. And I think we have to consider the megaphones that have been um, opened up to us in our culture, such as social media and other things like that. We live in a country where we, it is our responsibility and our privilege to engage politically. If we do not respect or we do not hold the views of those who are in authority, we have the right and the privilege to, to change the, the situation, to vote, to raise awareness, to be actively engaged, but to do so with respect. It pains me when I see banners flying around in trucks that, that, that scream profanity at our president. And then taglines that have become a buzz line that are a mask for that very phrase. It ought not be. Especially when it comes out of brothers and sisters in the church. Hear me. If you stand opposed to political authorities, then we have the right and the privilege to, to vote according to the values that we have been given from Scripture. We can, we can campaign for those that we feel would give the best leadership locally at the state in the national levels. But we must watch the way we speak of those who have come to those positions. And to pray for them. This was convicting for me, personally is a pattern of prayer to pray for the blessing and the protection of our president and our national leaders a part of your prayer life. In this last week, did you or I spend time lifting them up Anyone pray for Gretchen Fagan this week? <laughs> Not campaigning, she's just our mayor. I don't know if you guys knew that or not, but that's her name, Gretchen Fagan. I mean, there's, we have an opportunity as the people of God to bring blessing and prayer. And if we do believe that prayer is powerful and effective, then we should be praying. And if we believe that the policies and the directions stand opposed to what would give true right to life, then we should pray and we should speak but do so respectfully. And if we were to think that we stand on some kind of higher moral ground, Paul gives us another reminder. Look at this, the second section of, of, our, of our passage, our salvation story. He says in Titus 3, 
For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. I think what Paul is reminding Titus to the church is that we do not have a higher moral ground. That when we look at what resides in the human heart, it really can be a broken and dark thing. Marked by these characteristics, foolish. Foolishness would maybe be defined as doing right in your own eyes. That's foolishness. Not taking in counsel from others, certainly not uh, submitting to the authority of Christ. Foolish. Doing what's right in our own eyes. Disobedient. Led astray. Opposed and hating others. And also being hated by others. Is it true that these words describe our world? Does this describe our world? Does this describe the nature of man and woman and our neighbors and our businesses and our leaders? It is. Because it's what resides within a depraved human heart. So Paul reminds the church of what they once were. But then he introduces the gospel message again. Look at verse 4. But when the goodness and the loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. There are several aspects to this passage I don't want you to miss. First of all, a theme in the, in the book of Titus is to, is to establish that Jesus Christ is God. And, he, and, and Paul does so in the using of the phrase, our Savior. And so he opens in Titus 1 talking about our great God and Savior. Then later he will, he will align our Savior, our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We'll look at this passage. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, in verse 4, jump down to the end of verse 6, whom he poured out on us richly through Christ, Jesus Christ our Savior. You should underline or connect those phrases because this is reinforcing the central truth that Jesus wasn't just simply a man. He wasn't a historical figure who just came and lived and died and that was the end of the story. Jesus was God who took on flesh he came and he lived among us. He died, he was buried, but he, because he is God and he is sinless, he rose from the dead. There was an actual resurrection. And Jesus Christ is our God. So you have this reinforced in this passage, the truth that Jesus is fully God. Also, you get the, the active work of the Trinity in this one section of verses. You have God, our Savior, and that He had a plan of salvation, and that that plan of salvation was done by the work of the Son through the washing and the regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. There's a couple of interpretations about what this regeneration and washing is. There would be some who would say that this refers to baptism, and that there's a role of baptism that actually washes and solidifies salvation. That's one view. Another view is that this is the, the inward renewing work of the Holy Spirit that, that happens at salvation. That when you place your faith and trust in Jesus, the Holy Spirit renews your heart, renews you from the inside out, and you are cleansed by His presence. We would teach and we would believe that it is the second interpretation that this is the unique work of the Holy Spirit that washes us and renews us. That the act of baptism is not in and of itself a, a spiritual cleansing work that was done by Jesus on the cross and that baptism is a physical demonstration 
showing others that we have been changed by Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit. And I kind of tease, our, the water we baptize people in is from Harris County, right? So it can't be that holy. <laughs> and if you want to know a passage that is like what Evan preached last week out of Titus 2, here is a beautifully written, packed doctrinally, almost like a poem for the church. See, we were once lost in our sin, but a good and loving kindness God appeared. And the appearance was through Jesus Christ, the Son, and He saved us, not by effort, not by work, but according to His mercy. Have you received that mercy of God, y'all? Do you know that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins and rose from the dead? And that in him, you have forgiveness. If we are outside of Christ, then that means that our hearts and our souls are searching for something. And even though we fill it with things of the world, we remain empty. We remain unsatisfied. That is the human condition. Foolish and led astray. Lost and without hope. But God, in his kindness and in his love for us, sent his son to be our rescue. To pull us out of a domain of darkness and bring us into the kingdom of the son that he loves. And that happens when we place our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ. Have you done that? Do you know the truth that Jesus died for you? And that he rose from the dead? And that by believing in him, you have life in his name. That is the shout of scripture and is the center of where all of our Christian doctrine flows. The person and the work of Jesus Christ. Verse 7. So that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is such a beautiful verse because of the grammar. Being justified. That means the way the grammar is written is that there was a once for all decision made that has ongoing ramifications that are permanent. There was a decision to make us right with God and that decision came when Jesus died on the cross for our sins and we received him by faith. To be justified means to be declared right before God. To be declared innocent where we were guilty. But the, the language says being justified. That means as we live our life, we remain under that label that we are right with God. Part of the Christian life is wrestling with doubts and shortcomings and things that can lead us to doubt the truth. But if you are in Christ, being made right with God continues and t continues up until the day of glorification when we are fully and finally in the presence of Christ. This is the center of doctrinal truth, and this is our salvation story. And I hope it's your salvation story. I once was this way, but Christ has become my life, and now I live to honor Him. Verse 3, or section 3, starting in verse 8. Paul says, this saying is trustworthy. It's sure. It's certain. This is the center of our, of our faith. And I want you to insist on these things. So that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. Okay. There's a reason that Paul is driving this gospel truth home. The reason is triggered by this word, these words, so that. He's saying this, this gospel truth statement is trustworthy, and we are to insist and reinforce these things so that those who have believed in God, and here's where we need to underline or circle, 
may be careful to devote themselves to good works. We'd be careful to devote themselves to good works. This echoes what Paul introduced in Titus chapter 1 when he opened up the letter and the purpose of the letter. And he said he's writing for the sake of the faith of God's elect, those who believe, and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness. Titus is a, is a book that pairs faith with action. Not that we would be saved by our works, but that works would flow out of our salvation. So those who, are, who believe are to be marked by a careful devotion to good works. And the two words that I really want to emphasize here are careful and devote. If you're going to be careful, it means that you take great care and that there is a great concern for people, for your actions. You guys can say, man, we really learned a lot. Pastor said careful means to be full of care. But are we, are we full of care for those around us who are lost in foolishness and disobedience and who are led astray? Are we full of care? And is that care directed towards something of the heart? That's the whole idea of devotion. It is a heartfelt, deep-seated from the guts, desire to serve others, to bless others, to love others, that we may be careful to devote themselves to good works, or they may be careful to devote themselves to good works. Paul then uses this word. He says, this is excellent. This is excellent, and everybody wins. It's profitable for everybody. It's profitable for the church. It's profitable for the community who served in the name of Jesus. The early church was marked by this. A Roman official or emperor named Julian said that what stood out amongst the people of the way was that they not only cared for themselves, but they met the needs of the poor. Are we full of care to be devoted to blessing and serving and loving others outside of ourselves? That's the question. That's what we are called into, and then Paul moves into what we are called away from. We're called into that, we're called out of, verse 9, but avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are are unprofitable and worthless. So he has already established what is profitable and what is of great worth. In fact, it's of such great worth that that Paul says it is excellent. It excels. Everyone wins when the church serves, when the church loves, when the church out of a salvation grace demonstrates the kindness of Jesus towards others. Everyone wins. But what is unprofitable and what is worthless is when we get caught up in arguing amongst ourselves. Foolish controversies. And it can be crazy. Become like a circus. We need pink elephants at the circus. No, we need white elephants at the circus. And a watching world can be confused when they see the church bickering at each other. It doesn't make sense. Why would they ever go to a place where people can't seem to get along? It says it's foolish controversies. It means this is how I think it should be done. Well, this is how I think it should be done. And those things clash against one another. Now, genealogies is more of a contextual issue. I don't think you and I are comparing our genealogical line going, well, really, you need to know I'm from this line, okay? You're not. But this was, for the Jewish culture, a very big deal. 
Remember, their roots were in a tribal system. There were 12 sons that became the 12 tribes of Israel. And there was some jockeying for position, especially if you were of a couple of tribes. One, the tribe of Levi. The tribe of Levi stood out because what came out of the tribe of Levi? What role for the people? Priests. Yeah. And then out of the tribe of Judah. That's the kingly line. And so there would be posturing and there would be looking for places of authority in religious settings amongst the the Jewish culture based off of who your father was and their father was and their father was and their father was and their father was. was. Therefore, I am. Uh, When we moved away from Topeka, we had friends who were uh, from, from India. And this is very much still a a hallmark of that culture of who your parents were defines your place in society. You guys know the name of the system. It's called the what? A caste system. It is opposed to the kingdom of God. We know that Paul addressed issues in the church in Corinth that, that were aligned to their to who they felt was the one, the voice that they should follow. Some wanted to follow Apollo. Some wanted to follow Peter. Some wanted to follow Paul. Follow Paul. Others were super holy. They're like, we follow Jesus, and that's better than y'all. And so they had that kind of attitude amongst themselves of looking at the, even their spiritual lineage, feeling like they had a, a better place than someone else. Of just comparison. It will be unprofitable and worthless. Dissensions and quarrels about the law. Again, the quarrels about the law would have been specifically targeted to those who wanted to add to grace. They wanted to add works of the law to grace to be truly a Christian. Whether that was ceremonial regulations or food regulations, it was the desire to add work to the salvation message. And they would fight about that. But it was unprofitable, worthless. What that does is it keeps the church focused on the inside rather than demonstrating a careful devotion to those who are on the outside. Paul takes this so seriously that he reinforces a process of church discipline against those who would be divisive. There's a time and a place, one warning, a second warning, and then to remove them, have nothing more to do with them knowing that that such a person is warped and sinful and is self-condemned. I find that phrase, self-condemned, important because the most repeated phrase in chapter 2 of what should define the church is self-controlled. So a life lived in the Spirit by the grace of God is a life of self-control. A life that is living in foolishness is a life that is self-condemning. So we have this call of what would be profitable and excellent if we would pursue it. A heart-filled devotion to those that we live with and a refrain from the silliness of what can divide us. He closes this letter telling Titus, help is on the way. This had to be, I know when you look at the, at the, uh, the, the, the conclusion of a letter, it can almost be a dismissal. We can almost just kind of, but put yourself in Titus's place. He's been called to raise up elders in one of the most selfish island cultures there was in the first century world. And he's like, when I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, that had to breathe some life into this young pastor like, oh, okay, all right, good. I got some partners in the gospel coming. He says, do your best to come to be at Nicopolis. So, so Titus has this instruction. Some are going to come, give you a spell. You're going to come and be refreshed in Nicopolis. We're going to do some ministry together and then perhaps return, for I've decided to spend the winter there. He says, do your best to speed Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their way. So there are other workers for the gospel with him and that he is now to send them out to do the work. And you can see the grace of God and how good it is because even salvation came to a lawyer. (laughs) He says, see that they lack nothing. But here's verse 14. Paul has a way of reinforcing the truth that he shared. And let our people learn to devote themselves to good works so as to help cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful. How do you know that you're in a healthy church? 
Let me tell you. A church is healthy when we, first of all, speak and act with respect toward authorities. That's a sign of health, that we speak and act with respect toward authorities. The speaking is how we regard them publicly, privately, how we pray for them, and how we engage in the government arena as believers. A church is healthy when we recall and reflect God's saving grace. We should be reminded often in this space about how Jesus rescued us. It's reorienting. It's reframing for us and refreshing to to be reminded that our life is is found only in Him and centered on Him and our, our lives are to reflect Him. And to keep that orientation for the church, we have to be reminded over and over of the gospel message. And a church is healthy when we know and meet pressing needs. This was modeled for me uh, by a group of churches in and around Little Rock, Arkansas. There was a desire that some churches had to really impact their, their city and their area. And so they hired a research group to come in, and they spent, this research group was tasked with, they, they, wanted one, they wanted to answer some questions, but one of the questions was, how is the church viewed by our city? And so this research group met with city officials and business leaders and patrons, and, and they took time and had a wide uh, research group. And they came back and gathered together to, to share their findings with this group of pastors. And they came up with an image and they said that according to your community, your city views you as an island without a bridge. They know you're in the city. They're not quite sure what you do. But there doesn't seem to be a lot of people leaving the island to come into the city. And we don't know how to get to you. And so they go, well... We better start building bridges. And so they took that image of a bridge to to shape shared initiatives to engage a city. To love them under the name of Jesus without strings attached. And the Lord has saw fit to bring over 100 like-minded churches to serve schools, to serve the, the poor to serve in the name of Christ together and share resources in order to do it. And it has launched somewhat of a movement in other communities where the same thing has happened. And it seems like the Lord is beginning a work with a group of pastors who cared for one another to devote themselves together to pray, to, to treat one another on the inside that now some things are happening by God's movement that's moving us outside. So this night of worship happening on April 2nd is a step. It is just a step to stand together as a community of believers and say Jesus is our life. To worship his name, to seek him in prayer. We're going to have Greg Greenlaw share the gospel message from, from our body. There's going to be some stories of testimony of how God has changed people's lives. All in a statement that even though we gather in different local churches, we have the same Savior and the same mission, filled with the same Spirit. And it's our desire then to prayerfully seek what will then be the next initiatives that we share together as churches. I will tell you, we changed the date three times. And it landed on April 2nd, so I realized there's a women's retreat. I really want you ladies to go to the retreat. I really, really do. But on that Saturday, April 2nd, will be the first step of this group of churches. Right now, there's an open invitation to at least 35 churches in our area to be a part of it. I have no idea how many will come. But we want to demonstrate the love of Christ. We want to declare the good news of Jesus. And we want to take steps together that we can partner with other other like-minded churches. We will not be a church that is all about Tomball Bible Church. The task is too great. The mission field is too large. And the harvest is too wonderful for us to hog it all.
This is the kind of church I want us to be. But we have a careful, caring, devoted vision for our city. Centered on doctrine, balanced in good works.